Today, uh, we are in our second week in the Sermon on the Mount. Last week was kind of foundational. We talked about the understanding of the kingdom of heaven. And we talked about uh, kind of how the kingdom can resonate here and now. And Jesus' main focus in teaching through the Sermon on the Mount, he mentions the kingdom eight different times. And we see this kind of played out that the life of a disciple and a believer is not about this world, but it is about the kingdom of heaven. It's that shift in thinking. It's kind of that counterculture ideology that Jesus presented over and over and over. Today, we actually get to jump into the actual text. We get to jump into the, the words of Jesus, and we're going to start with a portion of scripture known as the Beatitudes. And so that's in Matthew chapter five. So if you have your Bible, I encourage you, open your Bible to Matthew chapter five, verse three. Uh, It's just, if you have it on your phone or in in hand, I encourage you to follow along with us today. Later this summer, my family and I, we will be taking a road trip to Columbus, Ohio. And I know you're thinking, wow, Columbus, Ohio, what an incredible, magical place. Like how, how did you ever decide to go to Columbus? That just sounds like a dream vacation. The truth of the matter is I have a conference and my children get to come with us. It's really wonderful. It is a blessing for them uh, to spend time with us. And we're driving to Columbus. We're going to drive all the way up. Uh, We're going to stop halfway, make the second half of the trip the next day. But the, the reality is I don't know how to get to Columbus, Ohio. I don't think my wife knows how to get to Columbus, Ohio, unless she's holding out and hasn't told me. uh, And then she's going to be like, hey, surprise, I know the way, right? And that's cool. But that hasn't happened yet. So what we do know is that we have these little cool things called smartphones. And I've got important information such as where are we starting, which is here, or about half a mile from here at our home. And I have the end destination. I know where we're trying to get to. I know what we're trying to accomplish on the way, right? I know how we're, what we're trying to go. So we can punch that information in, and our phone will then generate all of these options. What is the shortest, the fastest? What is the cheapest, uh, you know, with, with tolls and, and all of these different things? And we can select and we can find our way there. When I was a kid, we used to take road trips all the time. My parents uh, were not about to splurge on flights to anything or anywhere. I swear, if we were going to go to like Europe, they were going to be like, get the rowboat ready, right? Like we weren't going to spend the money on extra things for travel. We road tripped everywhere. And so we took some awesome road trips. But before every road trip, we would start with the Atlas. And they would break open that bad boy and they would hold it, dad on one side, mom on the other holding it. And they would look and try to find and determine the best route. And in the moment, you cannot see out of the windshield because it is large and in charge, right? And so they're mapping this out and they would find what is the best way to go. And we took road trips everywhere. We we took road trips to Colorado. Uh, We took road trips to Florida. We took road trips up to Minnesota, up to Wisconsin. A lot, my mom's from Wisconsin, so we took a lot of road trips up to Wisconsin. Uh, Later on, I remember when I was a little older, we took road trips to Mount Rushmore. We drove, yes, all the way to South Dakota. (laughs) Uh, We took road trips to the Grand Canyon. We drove all over the place. We went everywhere. And I remember as a kid, I would take the Atlas in the back seat and try to figure out where are we and go along. I'd be like, Dad, are we in this town? He's like, no, we're in a whole other state. What are you looking at? And I'd be like, oh, that makes a lot of sense because I wasn't seeing that, right, or whatever. But now we have these little smartphones with GPS that, that give us not just the best route and the fastest way and, and multiple options as it's calculated in the real time based on traffic. And it'll also help divert you when things get a little wild and crazy. It even alerts you when there are what they call, what I like, they, they call them speed checks. We call them speed traps. But they call them speed checks. Like, hey, you might want to be careful through here because apparently people are reporting that cops are, okay, you get it. And so it just gives you this better way of knowing how to get from point A to point B. Like you find the best way to your destination in the safest, fastest, best way. The B attitudes are kind of like a GPS or like a map for us as we walk as disciples of Jesus. As Jesus is saying, listen, I'm challenging you and I'm calling you to live in a countercultural way to the world around you. And I'm challenging you to live in a way that glorifies me, that magnifies Jesus. And so he has for us these Beatitudes. And he's going to continue in this kind of thought and mindset beyond this as we walk through the Sermon on the Mount. But today, as we start with the Beatitudes, I want us to think of this as a guide and as a map for us, so to speak, on how to get to where Jesus is calling us to be. So if you have your Bibles again, verse three is where we're gonna begin in Matthew chapter five. And it says, blessed are the poor in spirit, 
for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Jesus, we love you. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the opportunity to dive in and to create understanding of what you're speaking and saying. Lord, we give you glory. We give you honor for it in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 Today, as we dive into this, I want to start with kind of that title, the Beatitudes. What are the Beatitudes? What in the world does that mean? And it comes from a Latin word, actually. And you're like, the Bible's not written in Latin. No, but it was translated into Latin uh, at one point. And, and so when it was translated into Latin, they used a word called beatus, which is a Latin word that we derive Beatitude. And it means blessed or happy. And so, so this is essentially, uh, in Latin, kind of the blessings or the happy I'm just I don't know where else to go with that, but like the happy, like, I don't know. Okay, so, so we have this understanding, this kind of stuck, right? This title stuck. And so if you're ever going like, uh, whenever I hear Beatitudes, I don't think of like a position or a posture of happiness or blessing. I just think of Matthew chapter five. And so this is where we have that term and that understanding. These are the blessings or, or the, the happiness, right? Essentially the Beatitudes. So let's start today with verse three. Blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, I will say this, and I've mentioned this, the Sermon on the Mount, we could spend a year walking through. And I will say this, the Beatitudes, we could take several months just to walk through these. So today, we're gonna do our best to go as in-depth as we can with the Beatitudes uh, while also uh, making sure we don't take all day to do it. Fair? Y'all say, somebody said amen. 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 Glory to God in the highest. I don't think I could go any longer than I have written anyways. My voice will finally give out at some point. So blessed are the poor in spirit. So to understand what Jesus is speaking about, we have to understand his language. The word poor is the Greek word that is used in reference to poverty, uh, in in reference to those who are bankrupt, who have the inability to provide or to take care of themselves. And there would be kind of two classes of the poor. There would be the working poor and then those that were just the, the begging poor. And so you'd have two levels of poor and you'd have the poverty of those that worked very, very, very hard and had very, very, very little. And then you have the level even below of those that don't even have the ability to work and they are the beggars and they are the lowest of the poverty that we see in this word being used. This is what Jesus is referencing, the most poor. And so we see this and Jesus is saying, blessed are the poor in spirit. And, and there's this understanding that we have to realize that, that Jesus isn't ex, you know, explicitly just stating, blessed are those who are poor, but that it is in reference to the condition of the spirit of the soul of the heart. Blessed are the poor in spirit, those who recognize the position of their soul. What does that mean? It's the recognition and understanding that we are spiritually bankrupt and unable to pay our debt. The reality is for each and every single one of us, our sin has caused and built a debt within us that we are unable to pay. And the Lord is saying, blessed are you when you recognize the fact that you cannot pay the spiritual debt that you have. It begins at first with the recognition of the depravity of our soul. And Jesus is saying, as a disciple, we have to realize this at the outset, that the very first thing that we walk with is an understanding continually, even beyond the point of salvation and recognition, that beyond that point that I am unable to pay my sin debt. Blessed are the poor in spirit. There is nothing I could do. There's no working I could do to accomplish or to earn the payment for my debt. I am essentially a spiritual beggar, unable to put food on the spiritual table. And Jesus says, blessed are you when you recognize and understand this. Yours is the kingdom of heaven. 
the blessing we receive from the Lord is the kingdom of heaven when we recognize that we are spiritually bankrupt. That no matter how, how horrible or how good of a person you may feel or think you are, we are all still poor in spirit. And it begins with the recognition of that in the first place. I've seen people that have tried to, to, to earn their way to it. And Jesus says, you can't pay for it. You don't have the spiritual equity. You don't have the spiritual income to make it happen. Only Jesus can pay it. You can even see kind of the relation between the, the actual poverty versus wealth kind of played out in this understanding because more often, and I'll, I'll say this because Jesus talks about how difficult it is for the wealthy to come to Jesus, to enter into the kingdom of heaven because there's this, this, this internal struggle. Perhaps that is because of through their wealth and, and, and their building up, they do not see need for anybody's help or assistance in any area because they are, are, are capable and able. There are those who are wealthy who know Jesus, amen? amen. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah, I, you know, it, it's a one, we want all to come to know Christ. That's, that's the truth and the heart of the matter. But more often we see those who truly live and walk in poverty who have no other source of hope but in Jesus who are able to fully surrender and recognize. Why? Because I think it's easier for them to realize and understand the condition of their heart in relation to their physical condition. And Jesus says in that there's blessing. Because the greatest reward and the greatest treasure we could ever find or hope is not found in this earth, but it is the kingdom of heaven. It says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Verse four, it says, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. I believe this, this portion, this, this verse has both uh, social and spiritual implication and application. Uh, we need to understand that, first of all, the Christian life is not all joy and laughter. We can have joy in the Lord in all things, yes, but it doesn't mean that every season is full of just happiness. But there is, in fact, pain and sorrow. We still experience grief. We still experience hurt. And there is still mourning in this world. And if you believe that because you're full of the spirit that this life should be wonderful bliss and that you have a smile on your face all the time, let me encourage you. It's just not the truth. <laughs> there is difficulty. But Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. The, the word tells us that, that the Lord is near to the brokenhearted. That the Holy Spirit is our comforter. And I think there is the understanding that we have to have, yes, that, that there is mourning in our grief and sorrow and there's comfort there. But I think that the mourning Jesus is speaking of goes beyond that and runs a little bit deeper into a deeper spiritual understanding that we recognize that we are spiritually bankrupt, we are sinners. And that the mourning that we see has to do more so with our transgressions and the sins that we have committed and that there is a sorrow that is upon us that says, God, I am so sorry. And we mourn and we grieve over the condition and the state of our heart. And we have to come to this place. And, and in the process of repentance, we've, we walk this at some level where we recognize that I'm a sinner and we come to the place of, uh, of contrition where I, I'm not just confessing that I have sin, but I have a heart of contrition, that I am sincere and contrite before the Lord. I am broken. I am mourning over my sin. And there is this realization that, that my sin separates me from God, that my sin casts me out of the presence of the Father and that there needs to be reconciliation and that my sin grieves his heart and that he is longing to be near me and in that I mourn over the condition of my heart. But I think the mourning goes even further in that we then mourn for the lost nature and the brokenness of our world and the sinfulness of those around us and there's this desire that the mourning leads to a depth of compassion for the lost people that we know that says, oh God, help me to pray for them, to be broken for them so that the sin that they walk in and that they carry can be reconciled to the Lord. So we mourn over our sin but we mourn for the sins of other Psalms. 119 verse 136 says, streams of tears flow from my eyes for your law is not obeyed. This is a weeping and a crying out to the Lord because the, the unrighteousness of the world around us saying, Lord, I, I want your law to be obeyed and to be observed and to be followed. People serving the Lord, walking with the Lord. And as they're not, let it break my heart. 
so that they may come to find you, so that it fuels a love and a passion for the lost. Confession is one thing, contrition is another, is what John Stott said. Was Ezra mistaken to pray and make confession, weeping and casting himself down before the house of God? Was Paul wrong to groan, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? And to write to to the church of Corinth, ought you not rather mourn? Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. There is no greater comfort than that of the Holy Spirit rushing in to the heart that is broken over their sin, to the heart that is broken over the nature and the condition of their soul that mourns and says, oh God, I am lost, I am broken, and I cannot pay the price, I cannot pay the penalty. And as we recognize, as we mourn, and the brokenness over this, the Holy Spirit floods in and begins to make witness to the Father of the the salvation that we have received. As we stand before the Lord, there is no greater comfort than that of the Holy Spirit coming to the soul that is broken and mourning over their sin. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Revelation 7, 17 speaks about the time when we will fully realize this, when we enter into eternity with Jesus. Yes, we can know it in the here and now, a level of comfort from the Holy Spirit, but this mourning will not completely cease in this world. But Revelation 7, 17 says, God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Verse 5, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. The meek realize their position before God and gladly live it out before their fellow humans. This is in that continued vein of thought, the poor in spirit, the mourning and the meek. This is our position before the Lord as we walk in humble submission to the Lord, as we stand in humility before God and have the understanding of the overarching nature of his sovereignty over us and that we are in submission to him. Meekness, a lot of it will imply or kind of describe it as humility, some will describe it as kindness, and I think really it falls somewhere in between of this, this kindness and this humility as we recognize and live in the position of submission under the Lord. That we say, God, as, as a heart that is humbled and gracious for the work that you've done in me, let me live in submission to you under the covering of the Lord. Meekness. In our world, meekness is not a character trait that we often uh, aspire to obtain. In fact, meekness is often kind of pushed aside as like the meek, oh, they're not the people that inherit the earth. Actually, they're the people that get walked over and walked on and pushed aside. And this isn't what meekness truly is. And one of the phrases, I didn't say this at first service, but the Bible calls us to be meek, not weak. There's a, there's a difference in, in, I'm not getting into that today, um, but Oftentimes, meekness is, is looked at as those that, that won't obtain much. They won't make it far because everybody else is going to push them aside and work you over. Because what we aspire to and what, what culture tells us is right is the, the drive and the push and, and get where you're going, accomplish your goals, leave a wake of destruction if need be. Just get what you're striving for. That's not meekness. That's not who we're called to be but it tells us that the meek will inherit the earth. And in fact, if you, if you look in Psalm 37, verse 11, it says, but the meek will inherit the land and enjoy peace and prosperity. What's happening in, in Psalm 37? David's writing about this incredible uh, battle and this struggle and the enemy is coming in and the evil is winning and, G- and, and, and the, the, the meek, essentially, David comes to the conclusion. He's like, but Lord, the meek will inherit the land as God speaks. He says, and they will live in peace and prosperity. But it says that the, that the inheritance of the earth will come. That, that's not a here and now necessarily. That, I'm not going to put limits on the blessing of the Lord, but what I will say is that we know that in the end there will be a new heaven and a new earth. And those of us that are in Jesus will reign with him in the new heaven and the new earth, and the meek will inherit the earth. 
and live in peace and prosperity. We have to have this shift in understanding that the pursuit of Jesus as a disciple of Jesus is not a, a here and now striving, but it is a shift in mindset for the kingdom of heaven. That we are not living for this world, but we are living for Jesus in the next. The meek will inherit the earth. Verse six, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. There should be a hunger and a thirst for his righteousness, to walk in his righteousness. I think we have to understand righteousness in, in, in really kind of three different realms. First, we have the legal righteousness. What do I mean by that? That means as sinners, as poor in spirit, bankrupt, uh, there needs to be some sort of justification, right? The price has to be paid. And so the first level of righteousness is this legal righteousness, as we would call it. This is justification. We are justified by faith, right? It is by our faith in Jesus that justification is given us. And in that, we are clothed then in his righteousness is what we see in Romans. And so we see this, this work that is played. This is that legal righteousness in essence, right? And I'm not talking about legalism in our faith. This is just kind of the term in, in realizing our debt paid, right? If you've ever had a debt, you know you sign papers and it becomes a very legally binding agreement. Essentially, our sin creates a, a legal agreement saying you owe a major debt that you cannot pay, good luck. And Jesus says, I got you. You put your faith in him. You are then justified, right? And so this is that legal level of righteousness. But we also see moral righteousness here. And that Jesus calls us to live a life of righteousness, not just to take on his righteousness and say, hey, thanks, I'm gonna do my thing. I'm going to turn from what you've called me to do and live how I choose to live, right? This is not an abuse of grace. This is walking in grace. And so we're gonna live a life that is righteous unto the Lord. Because the desire of our heart should be to live a life that is pleasing to God. To live a life that says, Lord, when you look at me, you smile. When you, when you look at me, you go, that is how I want my children to walk and to live. This desire to please the Lord. Is that how we earn salvation? Absolutely not. Because we can't earn it. The debt is too great. We can't pay that price. We're gonna keep coming back to this idea. But in response to, there should be this draw and this desire from the internal work within us to pursue the righteousness of Jesus from the inside out. I think if we examine righteousness in the biblical sense, there should be an understanding of social righteousness as well. Biblical righteousness is more than a private and personal affair. Although it is a private and personal affair, I think it goes further. I think there is a social righteousness, as we learn, even from the law and prophets, that is concerned with seeking man's liberation from oppression, from the promotion, you know, the promotion of civil rights, justice in the courts, integrity in business dealings, and honor in home and family affairs that we shouldn't just seek righteousness in our own lives and in the way that we live, but that there should be a desire, a hunger, and a thirst for righteousness in all areas around us. That on some level, there should be this cause to, to stir us onto action, into prayer, to see righteousness begin to permeate every aspect of the world around us in areas of, of, of social justice, in areas of, of integrity in business, in areas in our homes and in our families, that the righteousness of God, that it would prevail over all things, that it would absolutely prevail over all things. Jesus is challenging our hearts to have a continual longing for his righteousness. When my wife was, was pregnant with both of our children, with each child, she had cravings, as many women have during pregnancy. That's me speaking from a ton of experience here. Um, and, and they were never like wild or just absolutely crazy. Like, I, you know, you hear about these women that are like, oh, I need pickles and ice cream or whatever. And I'm like, what is that? That makes no sense. No, you don't. You don't need that. That's weird, right? 
So she had like just cravings. It was like with one of our children, she wanted pick, uh, uh, grapes all the time. Like, just got to eat grapes. I just need some grapes. Like, oh, uh, grapes is really, that's going to hit the spot. With our first child, she craved spicy Mexican food. Like, this is not, this is not a joke. This is truly like her cravings where she was like, man, I'm so hungry and I need like spicy Mexican food sounds like that would hit the spot. And literally the night before our son was born, it was a Sunday night and we had just had church and, and, and we, we go, she's like, I'm hungry and I'm not cooking. And I'm like, that's fine. You're pregnant. You do what you want. Like I just say yes. Okay. And so we go to this Mexican restaurant and she is, she is loving the food and the spicy, like the salsa, the chips and salsa. And it's like, this is really good. Well, later she started thinking like, oh man, that spicy food didn't settle right. And then we go, oh, we found out it was labor. Um, it's so, it's really funny how, you know, it's the first time we didn't know. It was like, this is our first kid. It was, uh, you know, so it's like the spicy food just spurred him on to be like, and it's time, right? Or whatever. But, but there was that hunger and that, that craving for the spicy Mexican food. Not just like, it couldn't just be like, oh, that was good Mexican food. No, like it had to have a, it had to pack a punch. Like it had to be hot. And so we have this, this, this craving and this desire. The only thing that was going to satisfy her was spicy Mexican food. The Lord's saying, as disciples of Jesus, the only thing that should ever satisfy our desire should be his righteousness that there should be this longing and this continual craving for the righteousness of Jesus, this continual craving for only his righteousness, that, that anything else we try to consume or fill us only leaves us unsatisfied, only leaves us longing for more of his righteousness. We can misplace our hunger and our thirst, but as disciples, we are created to long for and to desire the, the thirst of Jesus's righteousness. And he's, it's the, in essence, we find that you can pursue whatever you want. You could try to fill it with those things, but they will not fill you. Jesus says, hunger and thirst for righteousness. And the blessing that comes is you're filled. But the beauty of Jesus is that this hungering and this thirsting for righteousness ultimately creates a greater longing for more of his righteousness and all that he is. And we see Jesus with the woman at the well in John chapter four. And he goes to her and he says, will you draw me something to drink? She's like, well, the well is deep and you don't have anything to draw with. And Jesus ultimately gets to this point where he says, I've got living water that you don't know about. And, and if you were to drink of that, you would thirst no more. What does he mean? You would thirst no longer just for this water. This, this would only be like, okay, that satisfied only my physical thirst. But he said, if you drink of this water, you'll thirst no more for that. And there's this becomes this new desire and this longing for the living water of Jesus. He says, hunger and thirst for righteousness and you will be filled. It's this continual consuming and longing of a thirst that just cannot be fully satisfied. Uh, Martin Luther described it this way. He said, a hunger and a thirst for righteousness that can never be curbed or stopped or sated, one that looks for nothing and cares for nothing except the accomplishment and maintenance of the right, disposing everything that hinders this end. What is he saying? He's saying that this hungering and thirsting, this desire is saying anything that gets in my way of the pursuit of the righteousness of Jesus, I cast it off. I move it away. I get rid of it, which challenges the way that we live which challenges us to go, okay, if this is what Jesus is meaning, there are things that I need to stop consuming. There are things that I need to stop not being, being a part of. There are places I need to stop going because it is challenging and getting in the way of my pursuit of the righteousness of Jesus. Hunger and thirst for righteousness. And they will be filled. Verse seven, blessed are the merciful for they will receive mercy. I'm thankful for Richard Linsky, who distinguishes the difference between grace and mercy, because I think too often people kind of use them interchangeably and perhaps get them confused. They are two different things. So let's, let's clarify just a minute. The noun elios, which is the, the Greek word for mercy, always deals with what we see of pain, misery, and distress, the results of sin. Mercy deals with the results of sin. And, 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 and charis, which is grace, right, always deals with sin and guilt itself. The one extends relief, the other pardon. The one cures, heals, helps, and the other cleanses and reinstates. 
So Jesus isn't saying give grace, receive grace. He's saying give mercy, receive mercy. The side of it that deals with the pain, the misery, and the distress because of the sin. The part that that cures and heals and helps. This is not the the pardoning of sins. Again, there is no merit-based system in our salvation. You can't give grace to people and then the Lord go, now I'm gonna give you more grace. No, we surrender to Jesus, receive his grace, and then we give mercy. As a follower of Jesus, if we've received mercy, which we have received mercy, we should extend mercy. We should give mercy. Jesus kind of speaks of this this kind of cycle in in other ways because the idea of mercy deals with, with generosity, with forgiveness, with compassion. And we see Jesus talk about it as we continue in the Sermon on the Mount. We'll see more of this as, as he even says, uh, you know, forgive and be forgiven, right? Uh, and, and there's this understanding. We see Jesus say, give and it shall be given, right? There's this, this process we see over and over and over as it creates this cycle that we are called to give mercy. And as we give mercy, we receive mercy. But the problem often is we expect the blessing to come from others. But Jesus isn't speaking about a blessing. If you give mercy to this person, these people will give mercy. The the promise and the blessing is if you give mercy here, God will give mercy. He's the giver of the mercy. And oftentimes we look for the blessing in the here and now in the physical realm. And remember, we're talking about life in the kingdom. This is under the hand of God. This is the work of the Lord. So when you give mercy... God gives mercy. To walk in that cycle means to be receiving the blessing of God's mercy over and over and over. What do we see? His mercies are new when? Every morning. His mercies are new every morning. As we give mercy, we receive mercy. We walk in the very blessing and the cycle of the giving of the Lord. Verse eight, because we still have a ways to go. Praise God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Jesus begins to deal with an issue of the day that I would say is still an issue of this day. And he's dealing essentially with, with, with the, Pharaoh, the Pharisees, the Pharaohs. Yeah, because now Egypt is taking over Jerusalem at this time. Um, that didn't happen. Just okay. He's dealing with the Pharisees. And what does he often say about the Pharisees? He calls them whitewashed meaning that they're just, they basically put on a good, good facade. They look good, but they're really not good. One of my favorite moments is when Jesus says that, that they are like whitewashed tombs. Because what is he doing? He's literally saying that they are unclean. Why? Because they're just whitewashed tombs, which means on the inside, they have dead bones inside of them. Now they're touching something that's dead. Well, that means that they are unclean and unfit for worship. So Jesus is going right after their jugular. So he says, blessed are the pure in heart. For they will see God. Jesus is dealing with a a, a shift in thought that it's not about the outward appearance because the Pharisees knew how to clothe themselves, how to speak properly, and how to, to pray the right way, to allow others to look upon them and think, well, that is the picture of righteousness. Jesus deals with that in just a moment because he says, well, they've received their reward in full because everybody's like, well, look how great they are, but don't you want to receive the reward from the Lord? So Jesus says, blessed are the pure in heart, the ones whose heart is not wavering, whose motives are pure, who are right, who are focused only on Jesus, not worrying about what others may think or say, but walking with Jesus. David understood the need for a pure heart in Psalm 24. If you haven't picked up, Jesus is quoting a lot from the Psalms in the Sermon on the Mount and in the Beatitudes in Psalm 24, verse three and four, David said, who may ascend the mountain of the Lord, who may stand in his holy place, the one who has clean hands, and a pure heart who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false God. David understood the need for a pure heart, not wavering, but, but singly focused on the Lord, not, not half in and half out, not tiptoeing into the waters of the Lord only to decide it's a little too cold right now. Maybe when it warms up, I'll get back out. No, 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 a single-minded focus that says, Lord, I'm gonna live with a pure heart and motives to serve and to pursue you in all things. And the blessing is you will see God. 
It makes me think of Moses on the mountain with the Lord, and he's already had these incredible things happen. He spoke to the Lord in the burning bush, and the miracles have taken place, and the plagues, and the Red Sea has parted, and, and God is speaking and, and, and talking to him and building him up, and giving him the law, and all of these things, and it's not enough still for Moses, and he gets to the point, and, and he's like, Lord, show me your glory. The pure heart that is so focused on the Lord, God says, you'll see me. Now, is this a, as we understand it, you know, I don't imagine that this is a here and now kind of seeing, but this is to be. This is, they will see God. It it will come. It will be at some point. The Lord is saying, you will be in my very presence. You will spend eternity with me and you will see me. Blessed are the pure in heart for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. Who wants to be called a child of God? Amen. The beauty about being called a child of God, especially as we're talking about the kingdom of heaven as Jesus is speaking, is there's kind of this this, this sense of royalty. And and I hope as we talk through that and understanding of the child of God, that, that it kind of begins to change your identity in Christ, that you see yourself as Christ sees you as his child, you know, as, as, as a child of God, that the Bible tells us that we are heirs and co-heirs with Christ, that there is this understanding of the family that we are brought into and we are a part of. It's beautiful. And the beauty of all of this is it doesn't matter who your physical, earthly parents are. It, it doesn't matter your spiritual heritage. It doesn't matter your socioeconomic heritage. It does not matter the past or or the history, but but the Bible says, blessed are the peacemakers. That there is this call and this draw to be a peacemaker. Psalm 34, 14 says, seek peace and pursue it. One of my favorite oxymorons in the world is fight for peace. Peace. I say it all the time, and I absolutely love the idea because, right, peace as it is, it is the antithesis of fighting, right? It is the exact opposite, but yet there are things that are worth fighting for, and peace is one of them. And now fighting for peace may look different than fighting for other things. And I recognize that. I understand that. And the hope of peace is to bring reconciliation. And the hope of peace is to to cause things to settle and to calm. And the beauty about being a peacemaker, the beauty of peace as a whole, is that it is a divine work, especially as it pertains to our soul. There is no greater peace than knowing that we are in right standing before the Lord as God grants the peace of the work of his spirit as we are made righteous before him, justified by our faith. Amen? There is no greater peace than knowing that that I can boldly step into the throne room of God and and that his love and his grace will come and rest with me. There is no greater peace than when I make peace with the Lord, with my very soul. So blessed are the peacemakers. But we're called to be peacemakers as well, which means we must seek peace and pursue it. which means that there are those around us that don't know Jesus that we need to fight for the peace in their heart and their soul as well. There is a sense of evangelism that is attached to this portion. That says we seek peace, as we work and fight to be a peacemaker, that there are gonna be those who are lost around us that we go, man, I'm gonna fight for them. I'm gonna fight for their soul. I wanna fight so that they know what it is to have peace with the Lord, so that they know what it is to make peace with their Father in heaven, to make peace with Jesus, to have their, their spiritual poverty restored, that the price is paid, that the mourning that I've had for their sin, for their soul, that, that they feel that, that, that they begin to walk in the understanding of what it is to be at peace with Jesus. I think there's also a sense of understanding that we are called to fight for peace in our relationships in the here and now. I don't know if you've ever experienced uh, struggles or turmoil in relationships in your world. Perhaps you haven't. Perhaps you live in a state of perfect utopia and all relationships are just absolute perfection and to which you need to write a book. Uh, We would all pay a lot of money to have it. But there should be a sense that we fight for peace in our relationships, that, that we long for understanding and for reconciliation. Again, a work of the Lord. But, but let's not sacrifice true peace 
for what I will call cheap peace. Because you see, cheap peace is bought with cheap forgiveness. And cheap forgiveness is simply just a band-aid placed on things to cause the momentary uh, situation that has arose to be resolved and kind of put aside and pacified without ever extending true forgiveness. And so we hold it and we, when we hang on to it for the right moment, when, when things rise up again and there's another disruption in the relationship and the peace that we have maintained in some level of, 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 of just false ide- ideal of peace, all of a sudden it is thrown out the window because of one small thing, because we never fully and truly extended forgiveness. And so then when that is broken, all of a sudden we reach back to pull out the past and say, you did this and you did this before. So I challenge you, don't purchase cheap forgiveness or or purchase cheap peace with cheap forgiveness. Rather, walk again in the understanding of mercy. As we give mercy, we receive mercy. And through that mercy, we can extend forgiveness that is birthed by the love of Jesus as it flows through us. And that leads to true peace. Because when we truly forgive When we truly forgive, that doesn't mean we forget. We can be aware of what happened, but when we truly forgive, there should be a sense of peace and unity that goes beyond a realm of understanding or thinking that is truly birthed from the Spirit. We talked about this last week. We can't do this in our own ability. We can't make this happen in our own strength. We are incapable on our own, but it is by the work and the power of the Holy Spirit in us that enables us to, one, recognize that we're spiritually poor, to begin to mourn over the lost nature of our soul, to walk in meekness under the Lord, to to seek in hunger and thirst after righteousness, to be a peacemaker, to give mercy, This only happens by the work and the power of the Holy Spirit. Verse 10 through 12, it says, Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Here's what Jesus wants you to know. When you choose to fully surrender and walk as a disciple of Jesus in this countercultural idea of living in this world, there will be those who do not accept you how you are because it is contrary to their lifestyle, whether that is birthed out of the conviction of the Holy Spirit that they are feeling as they watch you live, or whether that is just purely birthed out of hatred against the church in the world, uh, from the world that we live in. Jesus says you're blessed when you are persecuted for him. The reality is in America, we don't experience persecution the same way they do in other parts of the world. I, I don't ever want to be ignorant of that fact. I recognize that because of religious freedom, that people don't just come busting in our doors because we worship Jesus. That is the reality in some parts of this world. That is the truth in some parts of of the world that that we live in. For us, uh, the persecution that we face is is somebody who is uh, perhaps a, a little bit of a, we would call them like a bully or someone who's a little bit against you because of your ideas and your faith and trying to live a godly life. And you may endure some comments. You may endure some, uh, some statements or things of that nature to which I would say uh, are still, in fact, persecution and still, in fact, hurt and, and may cause you to, to kind of cower back or you know, back down a little bit. But I encourage you to stand strong and to be firm while our persecution may look different, I, I, I will say this, that they, that may not always be the case in this world. As a pastor, I, I do try to stay aware of, of things being stated in the, in the world and as it pertains to religious freedom, as it pertains to the Christian church as a whole. And there has always been and there will always be a group of people who under the surface are trying to take away the freedoms and the rights of the Christian church. It's always kind of there. So I just kind of keep an eye on it, kind of keep an ear to it. Is that to say that next year, all of our rights are gonna be stripped and taken? Absolutely not. 
But we may begin to see at some point in the future, I'm not trying to put a timeline, this is not a prophetic word by any stretch of the imagination. This is just understanding that there may come a day that just simply preaching the gospel may be deemed as illegal or deemed as hate speech or deemed as, as some form of attack or affront against the world around us. And that's the truth of the matter, that that may come, may. I'm not saying it is, I'm saying it may come. And in that, we may face persecution. How does Jesus say to respond? Rejoice and be glad. And you're going, Pastor Ryan, that sounds terrible. What if we get tossed in prison over this, which is the reality for so many in this world today? To which I say, rejoice and be glad. James said, I count it all joy, which I'm like, James, you're crazy. When I face trials of many kinds, which is open-ended. That could be persecution. That could be so many things. But he's like, I count it all joy. Jesus says, rejoice and be glad when you're persecuted. Rejoice and be glad when they, when they say false things about you. Rejoice and be glad when, when these things come against you for my name's sake. Great is your reward in heaven. The shift continues in the work from Jesus and his words that we are not focused on what we receive in this world. This is temporary. This passes. This moves on. This doesn't gain for us any greater standing or status in the kingdom of heaven. This world is, is fleeting. It is passing. It is only but a moment in the reality of our life. And in the, the, the pursuit should then be of the kingdom of heaven and what is eternal. And he said, so if you're persecuted for my sake, if people come against you and bring you down and attack you for my name's sake, great is your reward in heaven. What a blessing it is to be considered worthy of persecution, which says simply that I lived a life so much like Jesus that it offended others. And hear me, these are easy things to say in our context. I can't stress that enough that I'm fully aware that there are pastors that this is their actual reality when they're speaking to the people in their congregation and their churches in, in other parts of, of the world and parts of, of Asia and parts of uh, even in Russia and places, things of that nature where Christianity is so heavily attacked and come against. I realize that. And I don't want to take our freedoms for granted in the fact that we get to preach the gospel and we get to boldly proclaim the love of Jesus and the grace of God in our world. But one day those freedoms may be taken. Are we willing to stand and face the persecution that may knock at our door? I'll invite Lauren to join me. Because as a disciple, what are we called to do? We are called to seek peace, to walk with meekness, keep our heart pure, mourn for the poor nature of the spirit, and when persecuted, rejoice. The reality is, is what Jesus calls us to and what he asks us to be is not glamorous in any way, shape, or form. What he calls us to is, isn't a, uh, a, a wonderful like, picture of like, that's the world I want. That's the life I want. You know why? It's because our, our human nature fights against our spirit. And the world around us tells us to pursue one thing. And Jesus is speaking and saying, no, 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 no. Pursue me, pursue me, pursue me. Run after me. He says, if you want to walk in, in, in true happiness, as, as we have the, the, the Latin word, if you want to walk, even the Greek kind of translates to, to happiness and this rea reality of, of what it means to be truly full of joy in the life of following Jesus. He says, live this way. It's where it's not about what we gain. It's not about what we become. It's not about how we are seen or viewed, but it's simply about how we are in pursuit of Jesus. So 
Father, this morning, in the name of Jesus, I pray, God, against every, every attack or every distraction that would want to enter the room right now in the name of Jesus. And I pray that you just begin to allow your spirit to rest in this place. Lord, that our hearts will just begin to become in alignment with you in the name of Jesus. And so, Father, I pray that you begin to allow your work to, to, to begin to fill this room. Holy Spirit, I pray that you speak to hearts beyond everything that would want to, to keep us from hearing and surrendering to your work right now. So in the name of Jesus, I pray, God, that there, there is any portion uh, of, of this word today that is resonating in any heart today, I pray, Lord, in the name of Jesus, that you begin to allow us to, to begin to speak with you. And Lord, let your Holy Spirit penetrate to our heart. Lord, if there's areas of conviction, Father, if it's, if it's the, 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 not the mourning over the condition of our soul, if it's not walking in meekness, if it's not being a peacemaker, Lord, if it's being in that, that duality of heart and not living with a pure heart, I pray in the name of Jesus that your spirit, oh God, will begin to work in us, that would begin to draw us into alignment with you in the mighty name of Jesus. And so, Father, I pray right now in this place that your Holy Spirit, God, just begin to fill this room. Fill this room, oh God. Fill this room, oh Lord. In the name of Jesus. This morning, I, I want to end a little differently than we normally do and, and, and maybe challenge you a little bit and, and push you a little bit. And I want to say, if you're here and you say, any one of these areas, any one of these things that is speaking to your heart or saying, man, that's me, that's me. I, I need to be more like that. This is what Jesus is calling me to be. And this is how he's shifting and shaping. If that's you, in just a moment, I'm going to have you stand up and I'm going to have you come forward. Is there anything sacred about the front of this room? Absolutely not. Can God meet you right where you are? Absolutely he can. But there is something about stepping out and responding and saying, I need to recognize this. I'm going to make that statement. I'm going to take that step and I'm going to run to the Lord and say, Jesus, will you come and fill me again with your spirit? Correct me, help me and solidify this moment as I rest in your presence, as I run after you, as I pursue you. And so if you say, Pastor Ryan, I, I, uh, I need to, to, to walk in a, a sense of mourning for the, for the spiritual nature of, of the world around me, or even say, Look, I haven't even fully walked in a contrite heart myself. There's not been a spirit of mourning over my own sin. Or, or perhaps you go, I, I've not been a peacemaker. In fact, I've been the opposite of, and rather than fighting for peace, I just fight. Or perhaps you would say, I don't walk in, in meekness. In fact, I often find myself placing myself above the Lord and telling him what we're going to do. And I need to walk in meekness and submission and humility under the Lord and in meekness to those around me. It could be the pure in heart where you go, I, I don't live with the pure heart, but, but my motives are back and forth. Some days it's for Jesus. Other days, most days, it's for me. Or perhaps it's the hungering and thirsting for righteousness where you go, you know what, I did, I hungered and I longed for righteousness, but, but now I live in such a way that, that righteousness is the longest, the furthest thing from my mind and my thoughts. And, and I just live how I choose to live and what pleases me and, and not a desire to please the Lord. In any one of these things, if that's you, just on the count of three, I want you to come forward and I want to pray with you. And here's what happens, church. When they come forward, when somebody steps out and comes forward, listen, I don't want them to come alone. So if someone near you gets up and comes forward, come and just begin to pray for them. Put your hand on them and just begin to pray. Holy Spirit, empower them. Holy Spirit, walk with them, strengthen them because we are the body of Christ together, right? And we have the ability to lay our hands on and to pray for others, amen? So here we go on the count of three. If that's you and you want to respond, one, two, three. If there's anyone this morning say, Pastor Ryan, I need to just, I need to have the Lord work in my heart and to change and to shift and challenge. If you're here, come forward. Anyone, 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 anyone. Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Others. Come on. You're not alone. You're not alone. You're not alone. You're standing with so many more in first service. You're not alone. You're not alone. If you see anyone up here you want to pray with, come, feel free and pray. Lay your hands on them. Be the body of Christ together. Come on, pray over them. Let's, let's pray together. Let's, let's reach out. Let's reach out to the heavens. Let's begin to ask the Lord to come and to speak and to move. In the name of Jesus.
Church, let's just worship for just a moment together. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the work that you're doing. Lord, we thank you for your heart that's being poured out, for your love, for your spirit, oh God. We pray, Lord, that you come and just begin to fill us. Lord, as we go, Lord, I pray that your spirit walk with us, that you lead us, that you guide us, that you direct us in all things, Lord, that in every step that we take, Father, I pray that you continue to work to bring our hearts more into alignment with where you're leading, that you continue to work to bring our minds and our thoughts into alignment with your word as you mold us, you shape us and transform us to be the disciples of Jesus that we are called to be. In the mighty name of Jesus, Lord, we give you glory. We give you honor for it in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, amen, amen, amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful week as we continue. Uh, come back next week as we continue in the Sermon on the Mount. God bless you. Have a great week. The best is yet to come.